my name is Sona. And my name is Sweetie, and welcome to What, what they, they Don't, don't tell, tell You podcast. podcast, the pre-dental edition. This is kind of like a different type of video, which is kind of the content we wanted to put out there for our non-traditional students. We want to talk about how do you go about these different opportunities, such as, you know, finding volunteering, shadowing, or extracurriculars, how to stay involved. Someone who maybe doesn't have so much free time or someone who is an undergrad, maybe traditional or non-traditional students, mm -hmm. because sometimes you don't really know what clubs are on, like what is going on at your school or if there's yeah. any non-profit organizations in your community. Mm -hmm. You don't really, you don't always know. So I guess the point of this video would be to share how we went about things since we are non-traditional and um, yeah. Yeah, so how did we find those opportunities both as an undergrad versus years later as a non-traditional student? Mm -hmm. And we also want to touch on letters of recommendation. We want to talk about how we went about getting those, especially maybe if you have been out of school for a long time and our approach to getting these letters. So, for example, like doing our master's program and mm -hmm. some people go back for a post back and stuff like that. So we're just going to talk about how we navigated through that and share some share some of it with you guys yeah <laughs> so should we start with that one the letters of recommendation we yeah so i, I guess like you so gave the gist yeah. <laughs> so for letters of recommendation i think for let's start with undergrad so if i was an undergrad student mm -hmm. how would you recommend going about that so the best way to go about it is if you're currently in your undergrad office hours so mm -hmm. make sure that when you get your syllabus the first day of class, you are aware of your professor's office hours and utilize those so that they at least know you. So once a professor knows you and you contact them later on in the semester, you already have a relationship. So it makes it less weird and less transactional. Like, let's say you're in class and you never talk to the teacher and then you need a letter and you're like, oh, dang, like how am I going to go to them? It makes it easier to already build that relationship. A lot of the times these professors are gonna be very approachable. I think this is not their first time doing this. Students ask them for recommendation letters probably regularly mm -hmm. and they know we are applying to different kinds of pre-professional programs. So don't be scared about that. I know for undergrad, I went to a very big university. So mm -hmm. we're talking 300 student lectures. So very hard to get to know your professor in that setting. And that's why going back to what you said, office hours, you need yeah. to do the work from the first day of class, like throughout the semester, don't just go towards the end when you need a letter because that's not beneficial I know. either. Like, I had an office hour meeting with my one of my professors. And at first, I, I just did the office hour meeting. Like I was like, mm -hmm. I don't even know where I'm about to tell them. Mm -hmm. So I went back and I'm like, okay, you know what? Let me figure out like what I'm going to say or if I need to help with. So I prepared. Like I went through the lectures the mm -hmm. day before and anything I didn't understand in class, I that was my segue mm -hmm. to starting a conversation and then... Like, yeah, by the way, um, I'm applying this semester. You know, I've really been enjoying this class, and mm -hmm. I'd love to get a letter of rec. Right. And he was like, okay. And I was like... <laughs> that, like that? Easy. That works? Like, yeah. oh, okay. Sometimes you just have to go for it and not be so scared. Because I know yeah. I was a very shy student mm -hmm. in undergrad, yeah. and it was really scary to approach. Also, they can ask for a resume, a cover letter, or, or I'm sorry, a resume or a CV. So have that in handy, too. I know I had a professor who asked for that who didn't really know me that intimately but like mm -hmm. he wrote it just based on my experiences and things like that okay yeah i know one of, one of the professors asked for my personal statement because mm -hmm. he didn't know me that much and he's like yeah. i want to make a good letter so mm -hmm. anything you can provide them i think it'll be great another thing i think people go through which i have also experienced is sometimes they'll ask you to write your own <laughs> So this like trips a lot of people up because sometimes they're so busy. They just say, mm -hmm. okay, you write your own because you know what you want in it and I'll sign it, which I'm sure schools know, right? People do that. <laughs> I don't know if that's like a secret or not, but well, what? Now you know. <laughs> <laughs> One of my professors asked me to do that as well. So definitely Google it. <laughs> There's lots yeah. of like, you know, formats that you can use. Obviously write your own experiences and your mm -hmm. own, you're hyping yourself up at the end of the day and make sure it sounds very... <laughs> Realistic. <laughs> or like, realistic. Realistic. Like, don't, yeah. don't go crazy. <laughs> Stick to the facts. Yeah. Because they still have to read it mm -hmm. too, right? Like they have to approve it and sign it mm -hmm. before you can send it anyway. So Yeah. I think for an undergrad, that's a good approach. Just mm -hmm. like you have 
really long time. You have literally four years to build relationships with these professors and definitely, you know, if one semester you forgot to do it, you have another one. So you could get a, you have the opportunity okay, to keep doing it. Time, yeah. But then what happened to us after we graduated <laughs> and we forgot about school yeah. and we went back six years later, how hard was it to get a recommendation letter? Let's talk about that. Because it's also specific, like you need two science professors mm-hmm. and I'm like, Ugh. I made myself as invisible as possible mm. in class, so I didn't even know how to approach it. I just emailed, honestly. Mm. Even if they say no, just ask. Like, worst case scenario, they say no, you move on to the next. They understand what you're going for. I'm pretty sure you're probably not the first student that asked them for a letter. So just be clear, be honest, and just try. Can't to try. I would also say don't take it personal when they say no, because I have had per- I went back five years later to ask for recommendation letters, and they all said no, wow. because they did not remember me. They didn't know who I was. It's been so long. I offered to give my resume, personal statement, whatever, and they all just said they were not comfortable writing that. I took a different route. I retook some upper level science courses mm-hmm. at a local college, and then I was able to get those rec letters from them. Okay. So sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. If we need to take another <laughs> class and get that letter, like. See, I got ghosted. So I got a yes. So mm-hmm. I emailed one professor. I got a yes. And then I sent everything he requested and mm-hmm. nothing. Just ghosted. Just ghosted. Yeah, and don't take it personal. Yeah, People I took have that. so much. Yeah, <laughs> I took that personal. But then I learned. I'm like, you know what? Step outside of yourself. Yeah. Like, understand that he's probably teaching eight classes. There's probably yeah. like a million students. Yeah, and then here's little me, four or five years later, like, hey, remember me? The reason they would say no is they want to stay, like, ethical. Like, mm-hmm. they, how can they recommend you if they don't remember you? Like, right. it's, you know, it doesn't work, so. Mm. That makes sense. Right? Because, like, what are they, <laughs> what are they writing? Um, professors submit their letters directly to ADSAS. They're supposed like, there's to. A, so... That's scary. Like, I don't know what you're... And you mean. wave your right, so you're not going to read what this says. Mm-hmm. So, like, let's say... Let's not go there. <laughs> Let's go there. Let's go there. Let's go there. So you don't want a bad recommendation letter either because the professor will be more honest to the like the ad sass versus mm-hmm. you. So he could even write like, oh, I really don't know this person that well, but like he has a free will and right to write that. So mm-hmm. you don't want a bad recommendation letter either. Yeah. So just be aware who you ask. Too. Mm-hmm. Like be cautious, but don't, yeah, just don't be afraid to ask. But also pay attention who you're asking. Like, be realistic about what it is. And if they say no, just understand that. It's not that you're being rejected. It's just that maybe it just doesn't fit into their schedule. They just don't remember. And I'd rather that than to have, like, a bad Mm -hmm. letter. So, obviously, we just started this master's program. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it was so much easier, obviously. Knowing what we know now (laughs) as older, non-traditional students, how to act in the classroom, how to form these relationships with these professors, Mm -hmm. and... Luckily, you know, I had a brand new set of rec letters versus my last time I applied last year, and they were exceptionally better. I also think the older versions of us know better that, like, instead of, like like you said, you try to, like, be invisible or stay away, and, like, now we know, like, you have to be very present. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, hi, my name is Sweetie. <laughs> exactly. You're very, like, be known, like, who we are. I feel like I used to make fun of people that used to sit in the front, and now I'm one of those people, yeah. and you know what, whatever. Because, like, <laughs> rec letters are fire, yeah. so. Like, sometimes, like, trying to be cool, like, redefine what cool is. I know mm. for, maybe for undergrad <laughs> students that are looking at this, like, don't think you're too cool to ask for anything, because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you, you're you trying to get somewhere. So remember that when you're, like, trying to sit in the back or trying to hide. Or like, skip class. I know yeah, like, I was such a bad undergrad yeah, I didn't, <laughs> student. Yeah. I would skip all the time. I just didn't. I just, I was just a mess. <laughs> I just didn't know what I was doing. I was just trying things and like yeah. going for it. Like, oh, I'm going to take this class, like whatever. I just yeah. didn't understand what type of student I needed to be for this exactly. kind of career. So mm. I can relate to that too. <laughs> just, now I always feel like, I always feel like there's this, bad rep for science professors like I feel like everyone is like so scared of them there's professors that I've had in the classroom that I'm like afraid like I'm like I don't even ask anything but then you go to their office hours and they're like the sweetest people in the world and I'm like mm-hmm. like I love you in your office I hate you in your classroom <laughs> but when you go to the office you get to know them on a personal level personal, too and yep. I think as an adult like I understand that better than when yep. I was younger because you're like so in your head and you're so a little bit selfish where like, mm-hmm. you think everything is about you and at that point right. it's like 
they probably had a long day. Like, it has <laughs> nothing to do with you. So now some extracurricular. So if you are a pre-dental student in undergrad, get involved early. Mm. I would definitely recommend it. Also, that was the best part of my college career, I think, were my extracurriculars, just the people I met and having so much under my belt, like knowledge and having so many positions in eboard. And I just loved it so much. First, just find your passion. They don't have to be dental related. One was a religious one. One was a sorority. The other was a community service based one. So it doesn't have to be completely dental related. Just find mm -hmm. your passions, then join those clubs. And they just like to see even the commitment for four years. I know for me, all five of my clubs had five or four year commitments. And they're like, wow, that's a long time to mm -hmm. continuously be committed to something. That looks so nice on your application. And mm -hmm. they always love asking questions about that. I went to a community college. I feel like it's so um, what's the word transient when I finally got to a university I'm working two jobs and going to school so I really didn't have the time to be part of any group I did try one pre-dental mm -hmm. society and it was cool but again I couldn't mm -hmm. participate in a lot of after school things because I had to rush off to work or I had homework so I know if there's any students out there that have the same experience as me some of the advice that I got was to bulk up on volunteering. See, you say, so you lack a little bit in the extracurriculars, mm -hmm. but you have a bonus in the employment because that's also yeah. seen as like a good right. thing. Exactly. A good so that's a perfect opportunity for, again, these like some of our non-traditional students, mm -hmm. like highlight that because I'm yeah. sure a lot of us have years of employment underneath our belt versus, you know, the things we did, mm -hmm. did or did not do in undergrad, like it's not gonna count as much. Yeah. Focus on like what you're doing now. There's always gonna be like a student, like affairs, like mm -hmm. in a big university or a small one, yeah. they're always gonna have something. Yeah, cause I know, like community colleges, they have a lot of resources to use. I just didn't know how to, I just didn't know. I was on, I was just trying to get in and get out. Right. And yeah, but I'm pretty sure if you ask or go to any student center, you'll be able to find some of the clubs that you can join. And now that everything's virtual. True. I feel like even if you can't physically be there, maybe you could log in online or something like that. True. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think as a older applicant, maybe extracurriculars might not be like your strongest point, but beef up those other areas. Mm -hmm. You can always still do volunteering. You can still get more shadowing hours in, more dental assisting hours in, beef up those other parts, and then they won't look so much on that part. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of, so volunteering. <laughs> I feel like at undergrad, it was everywhere. Like, but I don't know, if, again, maybe different experiences, but I went to a mm -hmm. larger university. You could do community service every single week if you wanted to. There was always an opportunity. There's always, we had so many clubs you could join. Even just like the student body would host like fundraisers. Mm -hmm. Like it was so easy to get involved. Like, for example, like Really for Life, if you've ever done that, or Global Days of Service, and mm -hmm. the whole city of Boston did that. Oh, wow. That's every, cool. yeah, twice a semester. And I loved it. So I think, <laughs> again, super easy for an undergrad to get involved. You just gotta find it. Yeah. At first, I felt like I didn't know where to look. That's why I mm -hmm. did so much on my own. So I would, since I moved to Florida, I moved to Florida by myself. I didn't know anyone, I didn't have family here. So during the holidays, I would cook at home and I would buy like the Dollar Tree um, containers mm -hmm. and I would go feed the homeless in like the Aww. really, really poor areas in Miami. Mm. And it was scary because I was doing it by myself, but that was that was my way to give back. Someone who is like, kind of like non-traditional or like maybe not in a master, stay consistent in one, one or two, because like that's easier to write on an application too. Mm -hmm. You want to quantify like every week I did four hours at one place and they want to see consistency too. So I did that for a whole year. It doesn't really matter. You know, you don't need to do too much because I think people have kids, people are working, <laughs> yeah. whatever it may be. Like it doesn't have to be a huge thing, literally four hours every week. And by the end of the year, it just shows you're consistent with it. Let's talk about shadowing. <laughs> did you start shadowing as a undergraduate? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. It was hard though. I think it's always hard. So how do we how do we start that? I was literally calling officers like I just want to come and watch you work, <laughs> please for free. I just called. I relentlessly called every office. I walked past, drove mm -hmm. past until I finally got a yes. Right. I think that's the only way to do it. Either call or walk inside and formally mm -hmm. introduce yourself because I think it's a sometimes actually no. Is it a liability for them? It is. Yeah. It is a liability to have someone that's not employed by them because in case you get hurt and less. You know, there's different laws in place, mm -hmm. so I understand them being hesitant, having yeah. like a pre-dental shadow, 
I uh, took that so personal. <laughs> I took that so personal. When yeah. I was like, after working in the office, I realized how much goes on. Mm. And some offices are just chaotic. Right. Like, you know, there's Most. a lot of patients. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of patients in and out. There's like mm. really serious procedures. There was surgical, like specialty offices. So it's, mm. it's hard. So you understand like where they're coming from. But you will, if you're persistent enough, you will find that office. Or if you have your, you know, your, your dental office that you go to. I think you can ask them because that's how I got my first shadowing experience. I went with yeah, my, me too. yeah. Finally, to hear that yes, I didn't even remember anyone said no. <laughs> <laughs> I think the same goes for dental assisting because I know I didn't take any formal course and I just called everywhere. And sometimes the right office will be willing to train you. Mm-hmm. Trying to work or shadow, I think mm-hmm. calling or like showing up in person is the best bet for that. It's the best for sure. I mean, now post COVID, call. <laughs> you don't want to go in person anymore. Like now we're adjusting to how you know things are so definitely call there's so many dentists now that are so open you can go on instagram DM and, them. yeah dm them or go on their website mm-hmm. anything really so do you have any advice for let's say someone who is an older applicant who has a nine to five already can't shadow during business hours how do you or what advice would you give them to try to find shadowing you have to make a sacrifice mm. you have to make a sacrifice It's all of, you might have to take a day off of work. You might have to find an office that opens on weekends. That's what I was going to recommend. You understand that there are sacrifices that you're going to have to make when you do this. Like there was times where I couldn't, like I had to work seven days a week from nine to 8 PM and there was, there are no dental offices open Mm. and I had to make a sacrifice. Like, okay, I'm going to have to take this day off. Or, you know, plan ahead, you know, explain to your job, like, what you're doing. I know some jobs, they don't care, but this is what you're going for. If You're going to have to make so many sacrifices, and I think that's just... That's one of them. That's just one of them, yeah. Mm. And it sucks, but <laughs> at the end, it's like, you have a goal that you're going for, so always keep that in mind. Right. I think as a pre-dent, I didn't even realize how many offices are open on the weekends. I never thought that was a thing until mm-hmm. it might be specific. I don't know yeah. if medical offices work the same way. I don't think they do, but I think it's a very dental thing to have. Mm-hmm. I also want to touch on research. So I didn't mm-hmm. do any <laughs> because I don't know. I've never <laughs> felt yeah. appe- like an appealing. Mm-hmm. And I know people say well, it's really good to have on your application. Did you ever think about doing research or no? <laughs> right. I feel like research is, I don't know. It's just not my thing. Not for me. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> like, I, don't I respect anybody who goes into research. Say if we wanted to do it, uh-huh. how would we go about it? Like, what would we do? For research? Yeah, like right now, oh. I want to do a research. Like, I want to get involved in research. Like, how would I even start? Honestly, <laughs> Google it. <laughs> Google it. Um, I guess you can reach out to dental schools or your school, the labs. I know lab. a lot of lab technicians are in research. That's what I was going to recommend. Mm-hmm. So I think for undergrad, reach out to the lab portions because you're going to have labs for what but Bi- not bio everything yeah but bi- no. bio yeah you have a lab for bio not oh bio so long i don't even know now you have lab bio, for bio chem. for chem gen chem physics um oh yeah all of them wow. histo lab <laughs> like yeah physiology try to get ta positions in the labs mm-hmm. reach out to anybody in that department because that's the best we got. <laughs> yeah. And also, don't feel forced yeah. to do it. Because I know a mm. lot of my friends that were pre-med, like, felt forced to do it. And I was like, if you don't enjoy yeah. it, like, just to make you look good on an application, like, why, you know? And no, yeah. I promise you, no one asked me why <laughs> I didn't have any research on my apps on in my mm. interviews or whatever. Yeah. Honestly, I would, if I wanted to do research, I think that I would be, like, fully in it. Yeah. Yeah, I think just writing papers is what scares me. Like, I would love to do research, but, like, to report my findings and, like, put it all together, yeah. like, I'm just, like... Mm. It just sounds very tedious mm. and, again, something I'm just not into. I'm just not passionate. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, takeaway, um, yeah, don't feel forced to do it. Whatever you're going to mm. do, just, like, put your whole heart into it. Yeah, so, if, you know, if you want to do volunteering, make sure you look up any organizations in your community, because I know that... People love doing studying abroad or going abroad to do, to give back to communities.
But what I've heard is lately schools want to know what you're doing in your community. And it makes sense too, as someone, like as a admissions person wanting someone, we want them to be also involved in like the school community, mm -hmm. right? And like, obviously the school has their own projects within their city and they want you to be involved in that too. Mm -hmm. So that makes complete sense. I just never thought about it. Yeah. Hmm. How would you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't tell you. So I hope that was helpful for both under an undergraduate pre-dental student and a non-traditional student who's been out of school for years. We've yeah. done it both <laughs> and we hope our experiences like resonated with somebody, whether you were super involved in undergrad or not at all. I hope you guys love this episode. Stay tuned. We are going to keep this series going. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. And like you guys know, make sure you subscribe, mm -hmm. <laughs> hit the like button, leave us a comment, share some stories with us. Make sure you hit that bell notification button so you know every time that we post. And our social medias are linked below. Feel free to DM us if you have any questions or if you are a non-traditional student looking for opportunities near you. Mm -hmm.